Okay, so Matthew chapter 5. We are wrapping up the Beatitudes this week after quite some time. Um, we've been going through it for a while now. Just one final time, I'll give you your quick uh, reminder of what we're seeing here contextually that John the Baptist and Jesus have both said the message is repent and for the kingdom of heaven is at hand that the kingdom of the Old Testament that had been promised to them for centuries was now within their reach but in the proclaiming of that message both Jesus and John were flying in the face of Pharisaic Judaism the Pharisees had taught everybody that if you were a part of Israel, if you were a Jew, that you automatically had a share of the kingdom to come, that you would have a place in it. Obviously, you have to be very, very righteous if you're going to have a good place in it, but you get a place nonetheless simply because you are a Jew. By John and Jesus both saying, repent, they are making it clear that the entry to the kingdom of heaven is limited. It is not something that you get into simply by means of birth. But it is something that is only open to those who are repentant in their hearts and have trusted in Yahweh by faith. And so when Jesus begins to teach, it is that same message that is being taught here in the Sermon on the Mount. And we see in the recent weeks that the, uh, the list of Beatitudes stretching from verses 3 to 10 is a twofold uh, statement each time. The first half seems to have a parallel with repent. In other words, who are the repentant? They're the poor in spirit. They're those who mourn, those who are lowly, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They are the merciful and they are the pure in heart. And then the other half of these Beatitudes is speaking of what blessings come to those repentant people in the kingdom of heaven. They will have the kingdom of heaven, they shall be comforted, they shall inherit the earth, their hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be satisfied, and they shall receive mercy, and as we ended last time, ultimately they shall see God. And what a glory that is. And so as we come to an end now, there are two more Beatitudes for us to look at. Again, as I said the last few weeks, we're looking here at not a blessing that is given, but rather a state of being. These are the ones who are flourishing. We are vastly better off if we are people who are repentant and meet these characteristics. And so this week, we start with the uh, uh, sixth, is it? No, seventh of the Beatitudes, um, which is blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now here, we, we need to uh, take a step back and have a look at this. The structure of the Beatitudes at this point seems to have shifted halfway through. And again, I'm a little cautious about overly stating this, as I said before, but we've gone from our state of our hearts with regards to God. We are lowly, we mourn over our sin, we hunger and thirst after righteousness, to in the second half starting to deal with how that change of heart, what a repentant heart looks like in how we interact with other people. And so it is that when we say here, blessed are the peacemakers, that it seems that in the context that it is speaking about how we deal with other people. It would be easy in one sense to purely see this in a sort of salvation kind of sense. There's a good argument to be made that those who make peace are creating peace between God and man, and essentially, the, the peacemakers are almost um, synonymous with those who do evangelism and make disciples. When we do evangelism, we are creating peace. And I think that there's a, there's a side perhaps to that. I'm not sure that really is Matthew's focus. But it is worth us noting that if we want to see peace on earth, then we don't support a particular political party or cause. 
We don't seek after various social changes that are going to, you know, charities that might help in war-torn countries and what have you. But, but the ultimate way to establish peace on earth is to resolve the cause of a lack of peace, which is man's conflict with God. That if everybody was a believer in Christ, we can safely say there would be no more war. That's what we're looking for in the kingdom, in the context of the kingdom. We're waiting for the kingdom to come and there will be peace on earth. The extent of his kingdom will be a peaceful kingdom. He will reign over a kingdom of peace. And so peacemaking is nowhere seen more greatly than in the act of making disciples and evangelizing the lost. That's how we see peace in the world. And I think that in this day and age, particularly in this country, it's very, very easy for the gospel to kind of get merged with some sort of quasi-political, nationalistic, sociological sort of mush, and, and that somehow our faith is expressed in, in, in sort of more kind of political ways. Now, that isn't to say that our politics and how we feel about life and values and what's right and wrong isn't impacted by our faith, because surely it is, hugely so, in every way. I'm not suggesting that we be apolitical. But what I am saying is we need to keep a laser focus on how the world is going to be changed. It's going to be changed by God sovereignly opening the eyes of the lost and bringing them to salvation so that they become repentant people who turn from their sins and turn to him and live in the newness of life empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's how the world changes. And the only part that we get to play in that, because we cannot open anybody's eyes by effort or by ourselves, the only part that we get to play is that God has determined that the way in which he opens eyes is through the proclaiming of the gospel and the teaching of the word. And that is our job and what we get to do. And it doesn't matter one jot if you are a pastor or not, if you have the gift of evangelism or not, you are the keepers of the gospel, keepers of that treasure that can transform an individual and when enough, enough individuals are transformed, transform the world. And yet we so often keep it to ourselves. We so often miss those opportunities when they're granted, don't seek them out. And so ultimately, I think that peacemaking is seen more than anything else in the proclaiming of the gospel. That said, with that little rabbit trail I've just run down, I'll run back again now. I think that contextually, that's not what is being focused on here by Matthew. The context seems to be at this point in the Beatitudes, the way in which we deal with other people. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Matthew is, oh Jesus as he's speaking, obviously Matthew reporting, is focusing now on what this repentant heart looks like in our dealings with others. And particularly, I think, contextually, because he's speaking to disciples within those, with those who are within the faith. Although clearly in a moment that's going to go beyond. Now... Let's talk a little about what it means to make peace when we are believers and how that is an expression of our repentant heart. This is going to be something that Matthew is going to deal, and again, all of these Beatitudes, they work themselves out further on. If you turn a little bit ahead to chapter 5 and verse 21... There is, um, as he starts to deal with it, you have heard it said, but I say to you, he talks about not being angry with your brother in verse 22. He talks about leaving your offering at the altar and being reconciled with your brother in verses 23 and 24. 
making friends quickly with your opponent at law, verse 25. These are themes that he will continue to pick up on. Verse 38, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your garment also. And whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. There is clearly a theme of peacemaking going on here. But what I want to really do now is turn to uh, one of the first sermons, one of the earliest books of the New Testament. That is, we've taught this recently at church, and it's a book that, that rests heavily on the context of the Sermon on the Mount, and therefore acts as a further explanation. Let's turn to James 3. Book of James, chapter 3. We will try and uh, take a little step back into the misty parts of our brains where we were doing James a few years ago. Those of you who were here, see if we can remember some of this stuff and uh, see how James helps us in this regard. So James 3 and verse 13. For those of you who weren't here in James, chapter 3 and verse 13 seems to act as the uh, absolute center of the book. It's the theological um, uh, high point, focus, if you like. It's structurally, con um, it's, it's constructed in such a way that this become, becomes the main point of the book. And this is it, verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good conduct his works in the gentleness of wisdom. Now, the key thing to understand in the book of James is that wisdom here is not used in the sense of, and by the way, you'll get James wrong from beginning to end if you misunderstand this. Wisdom is not used in the sense of, man, I don't know which job to take. I've been offered two jobs. I'll pray for wisdom. Like God will somehow give us some sort of understanding with regards to, you know, what particular option we should take. It's not that kind of wisdom at all. This is wisdom in the proverb sense. It's wisdom in the, in the sense of this is how we live our lives. In fact, wisdom in the book of James is pretty much parallel with the Beatitudes. It's what a repentant heart looks like. Are we living a wise life or a foolish life? And James presents these two ways. He tells us not to be double-minded. We can't live both ways. And this is a question then after two and a half chapters of James. He's having explained a little bit of what the Christian life should look like. He's asking the question, who among us has this wisdom? And if we do, how do we show that? We show it through our good conduct, our works, and with the gentleness of wisdom. In other words, a repentant heart expresses itself in the way that we conduct ourselves. Look at verse 14. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This is an interesting verse insofar as it's showing the opposite of wisdom. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition cannot coexist with wisdom. And thus, he speaks of lying against the truth. That we're so self-centered, so arrogant, that somehow we think that we, here we are being a Christian and we can just have bitterness and, and uh, bitter, a bitter jealousy and this uh, selfish ambition just raging in our hearts and that is a lie that's a misrepresentation of the gospel which teaches not just a relief from the punishment of sin eternally but a freeing from the burden of sin now that he gives us his Holy Spirit so that our lives are transformed. So that when we repent of our sin, that we are changed. And we live in the newness of life, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so when we, when we harbor these kind of things in our hearts, then we are lying about that truth. 
He then goes on to say that wisdom is not coming down, this wisdom is not coming down from above, that's the bitter jealousy and the selfish am ambition, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. It's no gift from heaven when you are selfish and jealous. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil practice. You see how this is just the, the sort of the high point of everything that James is saying in his book. He's just saying, look, there's, this is what a repentant heart looks like, and this is what an unregenerate heart looks like. And if you've got a heart that is natural and earthy and demonic, where sin rules and sin reigns, then you're either not saved or you're lying about the truth. This should not be. This is the whole point that he's making at this high point. And more so at the end of verse 16, that what happens here is this, that every kind of disorder and evil practice comes from the selfishness within our own heart. Now, this is crucial for us to understand what we're getting to today. Verse 17, in contrast to that earthly wisdom, the wisdom from above is first pure and then peaceable. See why I came to the passage. Considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruits, without doubting and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In other words, when we are putting aside jealousy and selfish ambition, not only do we rid ourselves of the disorder and evil practice that comes from that kind of thinking, that kind of heart, but rather the wisdom, which only comes from above, this is a gift of God. John 3, the wind blows where it wishes. And it is wisdom that is pure and it is peaceable. Look how it impacts those around us. Does it create disorder? Does it create evil practice? No, it brings about peace. It is considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit. And he emphasizes in verse 18 that the fruit that comes from this wisdom is sown in peace by those who make peace. James here is alluding to the Beatitudes. And we dealt with this in James to some degree, but James is kind of making multiple references to the Sermon on the Mount through his book. Because, and you can see why, I hope, as we've been doing the Beatitudes, that the Beatitudes say, this is what repentance looks like, and only those people have a place in the kingdom of heaven. And James is saying, if you're truly saved and have the wisdom from above, there's repentant fruit that comes from that. They're presenting the same thing. There are only two types of people, and there are only two ways to live, and we need to make sure that we are living in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we've been given, and that we're not living in the flesh and the sin that we have been free from. But James emphasizes at the end of that chapter, at the end of that section that summarizes the book, that this good fruit is sown in peace by those who make peace. We are peacemakers with regards to the brethren, fellow believers, we are peacemakers if we are living according to heavenly wisdom. Okay? Now, what does this look like? Let's go ignore the chapter break. They weren't there originally. Let's go one verse further on. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? This is such an important passage. If you're married, it's an even more important passage. <laughs> It's an important passage for us to understand with regards to being at peace and making peace. Okay? I think we know the answer to this because he's just told us in the previous verses. When we as Christians have quarrels and conflicts amongst ourselves, what is it that brings that about? Well, we know the answer from the previous verses. It's because there is a wisdom within us that's not from above, 
but is earthly, natural and demonic. Because it's that kind of wisdom that has selfish ambition. Rather than being the kind of wisdom that has compassion, that cares for others, that is submissive to the needs of others, that prioritizes others. If we go through our lives like 99% of this planet do, and quite frankly like the vast majority of Christians do as well, if we go through this life where our sole aim is to meet our own selfish ambitions, we are going to live in accordance with earthly wisdom. And there will be disorder and evil practice that comes from that, and thus there shall be quarrels. If you are married, you need to know this verse and know it well. Whenever you and your spouse feel that little tension brewing, or maybe you're a little bit beyond the little tension brewing, you have to stop and ask yourself this question. Where does this quarrel come from? Why is it here? And the answer is selfish ambition. That's the answer, always. Let me say this very clearly. I want us to just to, you know, to take this away and just to store it deep in our hearts, okay? So listen carefully. We as Christians are not called to adjust our ambition. It may be that before you were a Christian, your goal was to, you know, make lots of money or to, to sow your wild oats or to, to do whatever else it is in this world that might give you pleasure. That you were focused on you and this is how you want to live. I want to accomplish this and do that and meet this goal and make that and these are the things that I'm going to do. That these were your ambitions. And now you're a Christian. And sometimes we think that that means that we have to adjust our ambitions. Now I want to accomplish this for God. Now I want to do this in the church or whatever else. And particularly in church leadership, this is a huge issue. That we can just have sort of more Christianized ambitions. And, and let me just say in passing, I'm not knocking people having ambitions. I'm not knocking you pursuing a career or trying to be the best that you can be. But there is a sense in which when we are Christians, we don't simply adjust our ambitions to make them more Christian. But we put to death ambition, period. I still want you to go and be the best you can be. I still want you to go out and be the, be the absolute best at whatever it is that God's called you to. Don't mishear me. But what I am saying is, is that we are living our lives where what we want, what makes us happy, what tickles our fancy and gives us pleasure is no longer the center or the priority of our lives. But rather we seek to give God glory above all else, above all else, and then other people, are, particularly within the body, are of a higher priority than we are. That's what Christianity looks like. And in this country, for generations, we have acclimatized Christianity to simply be a rearranging of the deck chairs on the Titanic. But churches have become a place where we learn Christianese and we, we just adjust things so that they look more churchy and more Christiany. And we haven't really got to the grips with the fact that Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You're dead. What ambition? It's over. It's gone. My life is yours, Lord. Do with it as you will. And so, when we look at James 4 verse 1, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? That's why you have a fight with your spouse. Because you want this and they want that. 
You know the solution. Don't prioritise what you want. Sorted. There you go. You're welcome, by the way, married couples. There's the end of your strife. And, and, as, and as facetious as that sounds, it's actually right. If you don't care about being hurt or mistreated, if you don't care about your spouse not giving you what you want or, or, or meeting your needs or what have you, you won't ever be in conflict. You're welcome. Doesn't that save some money on therapy, hey? Eh? But that's what James is presenting to us here. And you know what? You read Christian books and Christian magazines and they're telling you about, oh, well, you know, so-and-so meeting this need and, you know, your spouse has needs and what have you. Now, that's fine because we need to be looking to serve our spouse. But when it comes to us, we're dead. We're dead. And what James is saying here is if you truly understand what wisdom from above looks like, then where are the quarrels and conflicts? And so he says as he goes on, you lust, these are your pleasures, the things that you want, you lust and you do not have, so you murder. Remember, he's referencing Sermon on the Mount, we're coming to that point, so we haven't got there yet, but most of you are familiar with when um, Jesus says, you've been told not to murder, but I tell you when you say Raka, when you hate your brother, that you have murdered in your heart and all of that, and we'll come to that, but you know enough to know what he's saying here, that there is, there is animosity in your heart why is there animosity towards another person that is causing conflict because you're not getting what you want <laughs> that's it you see and sometimes and I, people I've counseled some of these people sometimes people think well you know what if she would just or he would just do this and this and this and this and this then there wouldn't be a problem in other words, if they would just do all the things that I want, you know? Perfectly reasonable. And we have completely got it topsy-turvy. Because the answer is both parties thinking the opposite way. I should do what they want. I should meet their needs. I'm placing no requirement on them. It is the letting go of this self and maybe within our hearts right now, some of you think I'm overstating my case. That's your flesh. Put it to death. Just put it to death. Daily. We are incessantly selfish. Our lives, our minds, our hearts, they revolve around us 24-7. And for us to learn to walk as Christians should walk, we have to fight that urge daily. Because if we don't, and if we stop, it will overpower us and take us over yet again. And woe to us who Christianize our selfishness as if somehow that gives us some form of justification. And so he says, you're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Now there's a phrase that can be taken out of context and great harm can be done with it. In this flow of context, what he's saying is, is if you have desires, you go to God with those desires. And this is what he's building up to. He's building up to this whole concept where really we say, well, I'm not happy because my spouse this. I'm not happy because my boss this. I'm not happy because of circumstances this. What are you, who are you angry with? Oh, I'm not really angry with anyone. I'm just angry with circumstances. Is God sovereign or is he not sovereign? So many of us are shielding the reality that the person we're really cross with is God. Bring your needs to him. Ask him for what you want. But you ask and don't receive. Because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. Our prayer lives should be, Father, make me all you want me to be that you might use me for your glory. And too often it becomes a shopping list of things that we want that would please us. You adulteresses, 
Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? It is the way of the world, and it is not the way of Christ. Now, I could get lost in this passage forever. It's a glorious passage. Consider it homework. Have it, have it as a free one. Go away and read it and spend some time, meditate on it. It's a powerful passage. There's, uh, obviously, we taught through James, so the sermons for these passages are all on the website. You can go to them as you wish. But as we go back to Matthew now, I hope that we can see the picture that has been painted of why it is that repentant people are peacemakers. Why are repentant people peacemakers? Because we're lowly. We don't think of ourselves more highly than other people. Why are repentant people peacemakers? Because we really are hungering and thirsting after righteousness rather than our own goals and ambitions and desires. Why is it that we're peacemakers? Because we mourn over our sin rather than try and cherish it. We are the poor in spirit who see who we are in the light of Almighty God. So where is the a place for creating conflict as we pursue our own selfish ambitions? There is none. And so it is that we are defined as peacemakers. It is an outworking of a repentant heart and those who are peacemakers shall be called the sons of God. Now this is a significant, this is in harmony with what he's been saying and what I've been telling you with regards to the conflict with the religious system of the day. The phrase sons of God in the plural, not the son of God, but sons of God has already been referenced with regards to Israel. We saw that with the Matthew 2 quotation from Hosea 11. Verse 1, that there in that context that the Jews were the son of God, the firstborn of God. And now it is that Hosea, as he went through his book, spoke of another one, another son who was going to come. And there would be another exodus. And this new son would do a new exodus and there would be a very different result. Now this is not, this is not replacement theology. I've had to wade through many commentaries that have used this as a platform to proclaim their replacement theology. If you're not aware of what replacement theology is, it's this idea that God worked with Israel and he gave them some promises, but now they're done because they kind of let the side down. So he's done with them, finished with Israel, and now he's working with with Christians and all the promises of God to Israel we should just disregard those they can keep the curses though they're welcome to those but we'll, we'll get rid of the promises and, and they are really for the church and not for Israel that's a nonsense it makes God a liar that God promised something to anybody be it Israel unbelievers in their midst be it the unrepentant idolatrous Israel whether it be a pagan king whether it be a donkey. If God promises something, he delivers on his promises because he is God. So God will keep his promises to Israel with regards to the land, with regards to national salvation, and with regards to the line of the seed and the fulfillment of the promises through their blessed Messiah, who is now our Messiah too. So that's not what this is saying. But what it is saying is this. That the teaching of the Pharisees had been, you Israel are the sons of God and therefore of course you're going to have a place in the kingdom. And this is again the message that Jesus and John have been preaching in opposition to the Pharisees. They're preaching in opposition to the Pharisees because what they're saying is that those who are the sons of God and will have a place in God's kingdom those who have now have relationship with him or rather will have relationship with him in the kingdom are those who are repentant and not all of israel and of course it is that same terminology sons of god john famously at the center of his prologue says to those who believe he has given the right to be called sons of god we get to become part of God's family through faith. 
and this is what Jesus is saying. Now again, he's teaching Mosaic law. There is nothing new, there is nothing radical, there is nothing in contradiction to the Old Testament. Israel was always told, yeah, you're keeping the law, you're circumcising your babies in that regard, but you're not keeping the law properly. And what you have to do is you have to circumcise your heart. Circumcision of the heart in the Old Testament is essentially exactly the same thing as we mean by being born again in the new. It is coming to God in repentance and trusting in him because of your failure to live according to his will and his way. That's what Jesus is teaching here. Perfectly in accordance with Mosaic law. Now, there is one little paradox that is presented in this penultimate beatitude. One little paradox. If we understand that saying they shall be called sons of God is not just saying that the repentant have a place in the kingdom, though of course it is saying that, but more to the point, it's isolating the unrepentant Jews, like the Pharisees, then what is the irony that is being presented here? That in the very same beatitude that says, blessed are the peacemakers, there is a statement that is aggressive and divisive and is going to bring all of the fury of the Pharisees upon you. What does that tell us? It tells us that peacemaking cannot be understood in the broadest of senses. Peacemaking cannot be seen despite the pro protestations of the so-called progressive Christians of the day cannot be seen in going around and trying to not get into a squabble or a fight with anybody who might disagree with us. You want to go and say to the world, love is love? Is that what you want to do? Well, as a Christian, I stand against that. God defines love, not you. Is that going to make friends? Is that going to make you popular in downtown LA? I think not. Have you qualified as being a peacemaker by taking such a stand? Absolutely. Because if you don't take that stand, you have rejected heavenly wisdom, you have embraced earthly wisdom, and therefore you are the opposite of peacemakers. All you have done is chosen a different camp, and you have put yourself in opposition to God rather than in opposition to his enemies. Those who are peacemakers are making peace through the transformed heart that comes from being repentant. And there is no repentance aside from saying to God, you are God, I am not, you set the rules, I don't. My job is not to tell you what is right and wrong, but to bow before what you say is right and wrong. So let us not misunderstand peacemaking as being peaceful with everybody around us, and particularly with those who would be in opposition with the things of God. There may be times in this church where because we are committed to being a Bible-based church, because we are committed to discipleship, because we are committed to speaking the truth in love, that somebody in this building today may have to turn to you and say, brother or sister, I'm really sorry to say this, but I think you're in sin. And there's no more loving act or deed that you could do. And that is not causing conflict. That is making peace. Because we're addressing the problem with a lack of peace which is earthly wisdom that manifests itself through sin, disorder, and every evil practice. And so by confronting it, then we have an opportunity to rid ourselves of it. That's how churches are supposed to function. 
And somehow we've entered this era where everybody kind of pussyfoots around and doesn't tread on everybody's toes and we have to be nice to everybody and somehow we've equated Christian love with niceness. And there, is, there are few doctrines that have damaged the church more than that one. It doesn't mean to say that we're unpleasant. It doesn't mean to say that when we have difficult conversations, we don't do so laden with grace and gentleness and lots and lots of compassion, knowing that the next time it may well be us that is the one having to be confronted. But we must understand that taking a stand for what is right, confronting sin, that these are the acts of a peacemaker in the biblically defined definition. But, obviously, in another sense, being a peacemaker is going to lead to an awful lot of conflict, which leads us nicely onto the final beatitude. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the one where I have the most issue with trying to do that nice split of 50-50 with the Beatitudes. These are our relationship with God. These are relationship with man. I think this last one is more of a summary statement that kind of wraps it up, but it brings it at the same time to a conclusion. I think when you see at the end, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, we're right back to where we started. It's the same ending that we have as we had in the first Beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so it's kind of, it's knitting them together. That, by the way, is even though we have the same word blessed in verse 11 coming up, is why I don't consider that to be part of the beatitude, strictly speaking. We have this nice, neat structure. Left-hand column, right-hand column, repentant, kingdom of heaven. And here at the end, we have the same ending as at the beginning. It seems to wrap it up quite nicely. But not only does it wrap it up, it brings it to its logical conclusion. And the logical conclusion that he is coming to is that when you are truly repentant, you don't just stick out from the Gentiles amongst you, but you stick out from the Jews amongst you. When you are truly a Christian, when you are living according to earth, a heavenly wisdom, when you are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be radically different to most people and most churches. And you will cause conflict. And Christians today are having to make decisions. Where do we stand? Who's head of the church? Jesus or Caesar? Who sets the standards of morality? Scripture or society? We're having to make decisions and Christians everywhere are capitulating and compromising. And when we pursue heavenly wisdom, when we seek the ways of God, when we empty ourselves because we are poor in spirit and say, you are God and you set the rules, we are setting ourselves up for conflict. Why? How? If, we're, if, that's, what, if that's how we make peace... Why is living a repentant life bringing about conflict? Because the other people with whom we now have conflict are people who want to live according to their selfish ambitions. They want to define what is good. They want to say what is okay and not okay. And you must comply. And this is what we're seeing in society more and more. Not simply you being told that you must allow other people to live life their way, but that you must comply with their way. You must use the pronouns that they wish you to use, or the name that they wish you to use. You must play along with their games, their self-identification. You must do as you are told. Why? Because when you say no, you expose their selfish ambition. You expose their self 
deification. And what Paul said in Romans 1 is still 100% true, which is that they know that there is a God because it is self-evident. God has made it clear to them. There is a God, he creates, and he gives life. And their denial of God, their denial of him, is them suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness. So in the broadest sense, when you say no, I will not comply, you expose their unrighteousness that they want covered up and hidden, but only brought out into the open if it can be acknowledged as good and wonderful and bowed down before. And so, repentant people, despite being defined as peacemakers, are people who will find conflict wherever they go. And thus, as Brian read for us this morning in the reading, 2 Timothy 3, Paul gave to Timothy one of those glorious promises. Now, when I was a kid, we used to have Christian bookstores. I'm not sure they exist much anymore, but... We used to have Christian bookstores and I go to the Christian bookstore in town when I first was saved as a teenager and they had little books, little, what I would call the fluffy books and uh, they'd also have a good range in things like cards and posters and the posters wouldn't be you know, rock bands and stuff, it would be promises, you know. God will comfort you with his love, quote the Bible verse and there there is a you know, a baby kitten lying down and nestling under the feathers of a duck. No conflict between those animals. Oh, no, no. Why? Because the, the God, of all com- God will comfort you with his love. You know, you get those kind of little promises that are wrenched out of their context, throw in a couple of animals that normally fight, make them babies, make them look cuddly, stick it on a poster, you've got a sale. It's kind of how Christian bookshops worked in those days. I always wish that someone would do this in a poster. Paul's promise to Timothy. If you seek to live godly in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. Perhaps we could have a picture of the kitten with the duck's head in its mouth. Or something like that to kind of paint the picture. It's a promise. And what that promise tells us is something really important. If you're not being persecuted, you're probably not seeking to live a godly life. Remember, a while back, someone who I worked with in church leadership saying, you know, I've never really had much trouble in my life. I've never really suffered at all. I don't really feel I've had any persecution. I've had quite an easy life. And I'm like, man, you're doing something wrong. Seriously, how are, you, how are you going through life without conflict? Why well, is that Christian niceness again? There has never been a time, friends, when we need to take a stand more clearly and more boldly. You don't get to hide away. You don't get to just try to avoid the issues. You have to take a stand. You have to say, I am with Christ and what may come will come. So be it. Here I lie. I am his. He is mine. He declares what is good and what is evil. And I abide by those definitions and I will not be moved. Though you may slay me, I will trust in him. I will give my life for him. Now is the time for us to take a stand. And you say, well, maybe I haven't been a Christian long enough to have much persecution. Notice the change in case here in verse 10. In all the previous Beatitudes, it's present tense. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And now it is, blessed are those who have been In other words, if you are a disciple and if you are repentant, you've already been persecuted. You've already had somebody 
give you persecution, conflict, there's been some form of suffering, there's some sort of trial or struggle that has come. But notice here, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Not blessed are those who are persecuted because they are a numbskull. Not blessed are those who are persecuted because they are careless. Not blessed are those who are persecuted because they're impatient. Not blessed are those who are persecuted because they are selfish. Not blessed are those who are persecuted because they did the right thing in the most obnoxious way possible. Because there are certainly a few Christians that fit into that category. There are plenty of times that we bring the ire of others unnecessarily. It is clear that the blessing is only on those who have been persecuted for doing what is right. And so it is, as he concludes the Beatitudes, that the statement is, is that we who have repentant hearts are the ones who will see the kingdom of heaven. We understand who is God, and we are certainly not. We have the right perspective of who we are in light of him, and our lives and our hearts have been transformed so that we hate our own sin and we desire the things of God. And as a result, we live differently. We who have been forgiven much, we forgive others. We are merciful. We seek to live as we should. We are pure in heart. And because there is heavenly wisdom within us and not earthly wisdom, we are peacemakers. And one thing that we can be sure of as we live in this world is that that will find opposition and we will be persecuted. In fact, if we're living as we should, we already have been. Make the decision today, friends. I'm going to live for Jesus, whatever the cost. Whatever the cost. And so because Jesus ends on that high note, (laughs) it's, uh, it's appropriate for him to say some more. It's almost as if people would hear that and go, you what? Are you sure about that, Jesus? We're blessed when we're persecuted. So Jesus emphasizes. And again, we don't have the same structure here. The Beatitudes have now ended, and he's explaining that last one in a little bit more detail. And what he's doing here in this additional commentary in these next two verses is he's giving some additional information on top of what the Mosaic Law has taught. The, The previous Beatitudes, there's nothing new. This is what it meant to be a believer trusting in Yahweh in Old Testament times. There's nothing here that's not found in the law of Moses. What Jesus is going to say to them now is additional. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So firstly, this persecution is expanded upon it. We're given more ways in which this happens. It could be people insulting you. It could just be negativity given in your direction. Persecution could be more severe than that. And a lot of this does involve words and people speaking evil and slandering you. Falsely saying all kinds of evil against you. And uh, we as a church certainly know about that. So, what is new here? The last word, or the last three words if you like. Because of me. These three words are crucial. If you're going to be obedient to Mosaic law, then you're, gonna, you're going to be blessed, flourish, but be persecuted. And now it's because of me. What Jesus is doing with those three words is he is basically drawing a line in the sand. If you are going to be faithful Jews, keeping the law, living as you should, then you need to be a follower of me. If you reject me, you've rejected God and you've rejected his way of living. 
because the Mosaic law ultimately pointed to a prophet that would be greater than Moses. It pointed to one who would be Melchizedekan, both priest and king. It pointed to one who would be a sacrifice for sin. It pointed to their Messiah. And he is now here. And if you reject him, you're on team Pharisee, you're opposed to the law of Moses, you're opposed to following God, and you don't truly trust in him. But if you do trust in Christ, then you are fulfilling the law in that. And so it is that Jesus, with those three words, because of me, is saying that the pursuit of righteousness is equated with the following of him. You can't be righteous and not follow him. And you can't not follow him and be righteous. And it's worth remembering. We live in a time where there's a resurgence of Eastern mysticism. And it seems to me that sort of Eastern mysticism, Eastern religion, New Age thought has sort of taken psychology by the hand and it's gotten even in, into Christian books and understanding and what have you. And we, we can have no place for this. We can't tolerate such syncretism. What we need to understand is this, that somebody can say that they're spiritual, someone can say that they're religious, Someone can use all types of religious terminology. We, I see this all the time with Christians. Somebody will say something about God at some Hollywood event. Oh, look, my favorite actor mentioned God. Isn't that wonderful? So what? No prizes for being spiritual. The vast majority of Hollywood down the road are spiritual, who would describe themselves so in some way or another. But it's doctrines of demons. It's earthly wisdom. It's got nothing to do with Christ. And sometimes people will even use the name of Jesus, whereas we need to understand here that the only time you're going to be persecuted for Jesus is when you live this repentant life that is so offensive to the world around us. And I sometimes see famous people dropping a little Jesus here and dropping a little Jesus there. And I'm like, come on, stand up. Here you are in the midst of this despicable, disgusting cesspit that is Hollywood and you're surrounded by everything that is opposed to what Jesus is about and you just want to blend in and camouflage yourself in the scenery and then maybe once every few years at an awards festival you'll do a little Jesus. No prizes for that. Zero. None at all. You have to be persecuted because of him. Otherwise don't go telling me that you have a repentant heart. And it, ugh, it, it, it angers me that false churches like Hillsong and those kind of places have been so successful in the world of entertainment in our vicinity. And it makes perfect sense because they're both superficial and fluffy and empty. So they go together really well. But it drives me mad because you get these people who can play this game where they say, oh, I'm a Christian, let me say the word Jesus every now and again, and their life looks nothing like the Beatitudes. And I wish I could sit down with the Justin Biebers and Chris Pratts of the world and say, Book of James, guys, let's do it. Because there will be many on that day who say, Lord, Lord, didn't I mention your name at an awards festival? And he will say to them, get away from me, I never knew you. Unless you think that if I point the finger at Hollywood, I'm not pointing to a tendency within God's own church. 
let's be absolutely clear that we need to have this passage as being both an encouragement to us when we start to see God replace our selfish ambition with a hunger and thirst for righteousness, when we look at our failings and we mourn over them, when we start to treat people differently, when we start to see these signs in our lives, this is a great cause of encouragement. But if we don't see this in our lives, then this is a warning to the church as much as to any other place in the world. And finally, when we are persecuted, when we live those repentant lives, when we seek the kingdom of heaven, when we live righteously, when we do so because of Christ and what he's done in our hearts, that we can no longer say, I will fit in with the world around me, but I am Christ and his alone. Then when we are persecuted, the command is here. Two commands. Rejoice and be glad. I can tell you, and I'm sure you have experience of this and you can concur with me, that when people speak falsely of you, when people persecute you, when people insult you, it's not fun. It's not fun. It's not nice. When your family rejects you, it's not nice. When friends that you love don't love you anymore. It's not nice. When people accuse you of things that aren't true, not nice. So how is it then that we are commanded to rejoice and be glad? Look at this carefully. For your reward in heaven is great. Your reward in heaven is great. You see, the problem that we have even when we're living according to heavenly wisdom, even when we're, we're going through life and we're trying to walk with the power of the Holy Spirit, the problem is, is it's so easy for our eyes to just become fixed on the here and now rather than looking ahead. There's going to come a time when this world around us is no longer here when we're no longer part of it. When you're in that conflict with your spouse, seeing as we had that example earlier with James, there'll be a time when you're not married anymore. One of you will die. You won't get unlimited opportunities to crush your selfishness and prioritize that other person. The number of times that you get to do that is dissipating. The number of times that you get, the amount of time you get to wage war on your pride, on your sin, on your flesh, is going, it's disappearing, it's shrinking. And then there will be that day where if we are truly repentant, we will see him face to face. And we will never wish, oh, if only I'd gotten my way about which TV channel we watch tonight. You will never wish that you had been more ambitious, that you'd have accomplished more. The only thing that will matter when you see him face to face will be him. And that's how we should live now. And when we live this way, and when we are persecuted, there's rewards in heaven. Can you imagine how different it would be if every time someone treated you badly, they made a transaction? We, we ha I, I got one of these newfangled cards. It makes me feel really old. But now when I go places, I just tap. It's bizarre. It doesn't feel safe to me. I feel like I need to put in a code or sign something. But I, I just tap. And they take money from me, and it's done. 
Wouldn't it be cool if every time someone cut you up in traffic, there was a tap? Oh, man, that guy's just cut me up. Oh, I got 10 bucks. Oh, that's all right. I wonder if he's going to cut me up. That'll be great. Ah, how was your drive to work today, dear? You know, it was tough. I didn't get cut up at all. You'd, you'd be like, you'd be excited every time you got cut up because, you know, cut up, tap, dunk, 10 bucks. Every single time you're insulted for the sake of Christ. Every time you take a stand and do what's right and it works out negatively here and now, God is tapping. And your rewards are growing. And that might seem like a silly example, but it's exactly the analogy that he's using here. He's talking about rewards. Every time it's an opportunity. Every time we give someone the gospel and they reject us and spit in our faces, there we go, tap. And yet we don't because we're embarrassed. Well, if they're not interested, it'll be like a really awkward conversation. Oh, no. There was an opportunity that was lost. Our eyes are too much on this world because our hearts are too much in this world. And I love this last statement where he wraps it up. He says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I can't wait to meet Isaiah. I can't wait to meet Jeremiah, right? What they went through for the sake of God, how did they remain faithful? All the struggles of Jeremiah that he expresses in his writings. I, these guys are amazing to me. You can be amazing too. Your worth is not established in how successful you are, humanly speaking. Your worth is established by how faithful you are to God and continue to be faithful as your faithfulness inevitably brings persecution. And when you recognize that every time those hardships and trials and sacrifices and suffering comes, that God's just going tap, 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 there will come a day when we will see him and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enjoy your rewards. That's the perspective we need to have. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how gracious and merciful that you are, that you have given us wisdom from above, not something that we sought after, but something you gave as a gift when you opened our eyes to your gospel, when you led us to repentance. And Father, it is my prayer that if any of us, as we now complete the Sermon on the Mount, uh, sorry, the Beatitudes, the start of a sermon, that if any of us here have been wondering, I just don't know if this is me, that, Lord, you might convict them even now to turn and to repent. And I pray, Lord, that as we look at it and then we see ourselves there, that we would be encouraged and that we would today again be motivated to press on, to be faithful in the midst of inevitable persecution, to stand strong, not to compromise, not to seek to hide away and camouflage our faith that we don't get into conflicts, but to stand firm and be faithful for you. But Lord, we all compromise. 
may we all be convicted again that there is a way of life that is for us. It involves putting to death our sin. And may we be as resolute as ever to follow you as we should, denying ourselves and taking up our cross as we follow your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.